I get most mad with myself, like, at school or when I do something embarrassing at school. Like, I always want to be the best at everything in the class, like, subject-wise, like, reading and math. So when I get it wrong and mad with myself, I want to be the best because I just don't really want to disappoint my parents. I don't want to disappoint my teacher, even though I know that they won't yell at me or anything. I still just want to impress them and not disappoint them. And I'm still in the advanced math group in my class, but I feel like I'm not good at math because some of it is a challenge for me and not the other people in my group. If I was, if everyone was looking at me while I was like doing terrible on a math test, I would feel like everyone's laughing at me and I would kind of feel like I should get kicked out of the school or something. Welcome to Dear Anxiety, the show about mental health and how we deal with it. That is a child's view of perfectionism, and that is the topic for today's episode of Dear Anxiety. I'm Ed Krasnick. My co-host, Rini Jane, is coming right up. Now, this is a show about mental health and how we deal with it. It's about our emotional health, something that we don't talk about enough. So we decided to do a show about it, and we're calling it Dear Anxiety, whether you like it or not. When it comes to emotional health, we're all children, so we all share these things together. We're a show that looks at uh, thoughts, feelings, practicing emotional fitness, resilience, happiness as a skill, being well in today's world. Now, this episode, we're going to talk, we're going to discover, we're going to explore something that isn't talked about that much, and that's perfectionism. My partner is a leading expert in resilience, anxiety relief, the founder of GoZen, which teaches resilience, happiness skills to kids, parents, and schools. She has a master's degree in applied positive psychology from University of Pennsylvania, and she is none other than Rini Jane. Rini, hello. Hello. Ah, Hello. (laughs) Um, How how did you come to this work? How do you tell them about how you came to this work and when you became perfect? What date and time? I became perfect this morning. I rolled out of bed. I looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, this is what I've been waiting for. I'm perfect. (laughs) If only people could do that, (laughs) even once in their lives. I came to this work. I am a recovering perfectionist. I'm a recovering many a thing. (laughs) Hello, my name is Rini Jane. I'm a former perfectionist. (laughs) Hi, Rini. Hi, Ed. And so I am here to talk about things from both a personal perspective and a professional perspective, because now I work with the younger versions of myself, kids who are amazing. Actually, they're much better than the younger versions of myself, let's be honest. And so I am here again, um, healing my inner child and also working with children. Thank you for being here with me, Ed. Why are you here? I'm happy to be here. I just want to know if there's coffee at this 12-step meeting. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I uh, my my inner child won't return my calls. I like Rini, like you, and like many people, um, have been very um, self-critical. Um, I've always tried to be. I've many times tried to be something that I'm not, which is perfect and less uh, less human. And so I've struggled with these issues my whole life. I'm a parent. I'm functioning. I'm walking. Sometimes even upright. But inside, um, I have a lot of stuff going on, and I'm trying to learn to practice things that help me to be happier and be well. Perfectionism, is that, is that connected with anxiety? Is it connected? And how, how does it connect for you? Yes. I mean, it's definitely a risk factor for certain types of anxiety, um, especially things such as OCD, um, and it shows up in a a lot of different ways, but then it has some commonalities. You know, the interesting, interesting thing about perfectionism is that I think that if you ask 10 people on the street what perfectionism is all about, that they would probably say it's about having really, really high standards and trying to achieve something impossible, right? And that would be true. But what I have found about perfectionism is that it's really not about going toward a goal. It's about not showing up at all, right? 
most of the perfectionistic kids that I have worked with are huge avoiders and procrastinators because what happens in this zeal to be perfect is that you are unable to to show up and be who you are, which paralyzes you, right? So it's not actually about going toward anything. It's more about running away from. I Yeah, it's not. And this is what the culture, this is what we hear from the time that we're little kids. Practice makes perfect. We are trying to become perfect at something and that that's a good thing. And really, it takes you away from self-acceptance. We're not accepting who we are and where we are. And that causes a lot of tension and it causes a lot of mental health issues. And perfectionism is one of the the byproducts of, of that, I think. Yeah, I think we quantify a lot of things a lot more than we used to. So we always, you know, when we grew up, there were grades, right? Well, I don't know about when you grew up, Ed. Were there grades back then? When you grew uh, up? There were no schools, there were no <laughs> grades, and there were no people. <laughs> so it was a lot easier. It was so much easier. But, yeah. you know, we had grades, but we didn't have quantification of every single thought that we had being posted on social media, how many likes it gets, how many shares it gets, how many, you know, everything is quantified. And so you have a scorecard for everything. And so really, it's easy to see where you stand socially, personally, you know, professionally, even. And that's hard. That's hard for any of us. And so I think that the goal rather than striving toward perfection, should really be striving toward progress because we are all a work in progress, including Ed and myself. Ed, are you a work in progress? I am. I'll just say that I'm a work. <laughs> you uh, are. You are a piece of work, Ed. I'm a piece of work. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I mean, there is so much that, that you, you know, this is such a difficult, uh, a challenging issue to put on oneself. And we're not, we're not trained for working towards progress. We're trained to, to try to be somewhere else, be perfect, be better, be better, be better, be better. But where does this come from? Does perfectionism, is there science behind this, Rini? And does perfectionism ac actually have a function? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that in the science, they have something called healthy perfectionism or adaptive perfectionism, things that help you be diligent and persevere through obstacles and keep going, sort of this stick to you know, that you might have when you're pursuing a goal and that would be seen as healthy perfectionism. I don't really call it healthy perfectionism. I call it mastery when you're trying to master a skill, right? Because for for me, in the work that I do, in the children that I do the work with, in the schools and the teachers, I see mostly maladaptive, unhealthy perfectionism that leads to paralysis, procrastination, self-criticism, lack of motivation. And so in terms of where it comes from, you know, as many things, um, it, there are a variety of factors. So yes, definitely there could be something in the genes. Um, there could be something biological. Um, there could be family standards and family values and done all with love, but that create an atmosphere that kind of leads or lends to perfectionism. You know, you're talking about messaging earlier. So we could be telling our kids that they are enough, but then sticking them in a system that's saying you're a number, you know, and you need to reach that number. So it could be there are environmental factors, societal factors. So there's a bunch of things that could lead to this, to the point where what you heard in the beginning with the child in the beginning that was saying, listen, you know, I'm, it's hard for me to show up as I am showing people the real me because I'm worried about what my teachers will think. I'm worried about what my parents will think. I'm worried about what my peers will think. Oh my goodness, it is so difficult. So in terms of the science, what I like to focus on is what works, you know, what are the right. things that we can do, some of the research-based things that we can do to help. And you mentioned uh, that you're, you're redefining, um, pro you're saying progress, are you making progress? And that, that is a, that's another way to approach this. We're not going for perfectionism, we're not going for perfect, we're going for progress. Yeah, I think that People say, listen, how do I get my child not to compare themselves to someone else? And again, in the world that we live in, the comparison is constant, right? We're put into grade factories, basically, where you're constantly compared to your peers, 
you're compared in social media to the other people that are on social media. So the comparison is there. So I think that's really hard to just eliminate. So what I would say is, yes, one, you're a work in progress. This is you versus you. So are you making progress against yourself? And then when you see others that are, quote unquote, doing better or making more progress, what inspiration can you take from them? Can you be inspired by that? What best practices can you take? So we're not going to take away the comparison, but can we reframe the comparison? And in response to that, how do I feel? What do I think? How do I feel? What, what am I telling myself? Because so much of you know, mental health seems to be about what I'm telling myself. And how do I tell myself messages that actually help me and make me feel good as opposed to criticize me and make me feel like I can't do anything right? Which is, you know, I think it's a lot of what goes on in people. I think, I think people don't speak it out loud, but it, it is happening. It's certainly happening to a lot of kids. Um, I think you're totally right. I think, again, a hallmark of perfectionism is self-criticism and beating yourself up. And somehow this has become very acceptable. It's socially acceptable to beat yourself up. Like, oh, my goodness. I'm, I can't believe that I didn't make more progress on this. I can't believe I'm not going to finish this. I don't have enough time in the day. Right. We all talk to ourselves like that and we do it out loud in front of our kids instead of treating ourselves like a friend would, which sounds hokey and cheesy and not as powerful. Oh, you know, anybody, anybody in your situation with everything that you have going on would maybe miss a deadline, right? Or have this happen to them. So that is not inner monologue or outer monologue that we usually have with ourselves. We usually don't treat ourselves like we treat our friends because we think that it's not motivating right? It's more motivating to be like, hey, you got to do this and you have to be better and you have to do more. But the research does not support that. The research supports a voice of self-compassion, treating yourself like you would treat your own friend. And so that's one of the things that I think that we can really teach our kids to change their inner voice. Absolutely. Like I have a, I have a 14-year-old daughter and the advice and the support that she gives her friends, the things that she is able to say to her friends are right on the money. It's always the right answer. It's, al it's always something that's very helpful and very loving, very kind. But that is, so, she's, so she has it. She has the language. We all have the language. We all know what to say to our friends, but we don't think of ourselves as a friend. Yes. I think another thing that happens with kids and with adults when they have a perfectionistic mindset is they start to procrastinate because it's just easier to put it off than to show up imperfect. I'd rather just avoid it altogether. And that way you don't have to have an excuse for, or that is the excuse for not being perfect. So that's hard to deal with for parents. When kids are completely avoiding things, they don't want to do their homework. They don't want to study for a test. They don't want to what appears to be lack of motivation is sometimes perfectionism rearing its ugly head. And it's not, it isn't a lack of motivation or being curious or a love of learning. It's really a fear of showing up as yourself in the place that you are at. So maybe we can do a role play around that. Let's get ready to role play. I think that's a great idea. Let's show them, uh, you know, how how a parent might uh, be able to deal with a, a child, uh, your child, who is, you know, suffering from perfectionism, um, not feeling like they're enough. So in this first one, um, I will be, uh, I'll be a kid coming home and uh, let's say I have a new class that I just started. And I'll tell Rini, who will play the part of my parent, you know, I'll tell her about it. Round one. Hi, how you doing? Hey, Hi. honey, how's it going? Uh, you know. How was yeah, school? Uh, not, it stunk. It was oh. awful. It was oh, awful. No. The class is awful. The, first of all, the class is awful. I don't belong there. Uh, I, you know, everybody's better than me. And I don't understand it. 
Okay. I don't understand this math. I don't understand what they're talking about. And I'm not going. Babe, I don't want to go back. Down. It's everybody, okay. everybody hates me in the class. I know that. That's not and true. I, just, I can't do math. I've of never been able to do can. math. Of course you can. Listen, dad and I are both pretty good at math. So you probably have the math gene in there somewhere. And you, not everybody hates you. And you're not bad at math. And you know, we just have to work on it. I'll work on it with you at home. Let's let's, let's just work on this. They're all so much smarter than me. You can't, if you're going to complain all the time, it's, you're never going to get anywhere. Okay. You're never going to reach any goals. You have to change your attitude immediately. I'm going in my room. Why don't you just go leave up? Me alone. Let's... Leave me alone. I can help you. I don't want to talk about it. Okay, so that's 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 what most I think that's a very familiar scene, that scene right there. Now, you what you're trying to do is you're trying to be supportive, you're trying to help me, you're trying to be kind to me and you're trying to tell me that it's going to be okay. But is it And then working? I got a little bit angry. <laughs> I was yeah. like, "Listen, you're not yeah. getting anywhere with that attitude." Like, yeah. Yeah. And so so we need we need skills. We need things that we can do to because the intention is to help our kids, right? It's not not to have a fight. It's not to be angry. It's not to you know look at them in a judgmental way. Um, so what can we do? What's a skill that we can use to do it differently? You know, in all of these role plays that we're doing on Dear Anxiety, you're going to hear a very similar first step, which is connection. And the way that I like to talk about it is think about when you have a problem as a grown up, as an adult at work or with a friend or in a relationship, and you want someone to listen to you. So the first step in connection is allowing a person to feel their feelings and connecting with them and leaving space for that. And as a parent, it's really hard because we want to jump in. Our knee jerk response is to jump in, to fix, to reassure, to fix the problem, essentially. So we're going to first empathize and connect, right? It'll allow the space for that bridge to be built really quickly and your kid to look at you and say, yep, you get it. Okay, let's continue on. That's step one. And then in this case, with what your child is going through, I would say there are lots of things that we can do with perfectionism. We're going to try itty bitty steps. Okay, we're going to try an itty bitty action that your child can take that they can't fail. The smallest thing that they can do. Okay. Round two. Hi, mom. Hey, honey. How's it going? How was school? Oh man, it was so. I hated it. It was so crappy. I couldn't. I couldn't understand what they were talking about. This class is way too hard for me. Oh, I hear you. It sounds like you had a hard time. What What's going on? Well, I did have a hard time because I couldn't understand what was going on, and everybody else seemed to understand it. So you couldn't understand it and it seems like everyone else was getting it. That sounds like it was really frustrating. It was frustrating and I don't belong in this class. I don't belong here. You feel like you don't belong? That is one of the hardest things. It's really hard. It's really hard. And I, and I, I don't know what to do about it because I don't know how I'm going to get it. I felt that way before, actually, recently. I have felt that way, you know, that everyone else is sort of getting something that's really hard. Well, you did feel that way? What, did, what do you do? What do you, what, what can I do? Yeah, you know, when you feel that way, sometimes you don't feel like doing anything. I completely understand. The first thing is, is that I would love to be there for you, to support you, to help you with it. You know, so I know that you, did you get homework today? Yes. Okay. So why don't we take a little break because you just got home and then I have some work to do. You can come and sit next to me. I know you don't feel like it. I can tell. I can see it on your face. That's not going to work, mom. It's not going to work. Yeah. You know what? I think you're thinking about the entire piece of paper. I think you're thinking about the entire homework assignment that you have to do. I think what we should do is take it super slow because I don't really feel like doing my work either, but I have to. So what's kind of the, what's the most basic thing we can do? What's the first step that we can do together? These problems and we just have to... Oh, problems. Let's not even get to the problems. How about, like, how about taking the book out of the bag? Or is that too easy? 
Uh, it's something I don't want to do. That's for sure. Okay. So let's just make a few little steps. We'll take the book out of the bag and then we'll open it and take out a piece of paper. I think I can do that much with, with my bag too. You know, I brought my backpack home. So we'll both bring our backpacks down and let's commit to just that. Taking out the book, taking out the piece of paper, and let's see if then we can get beyond that. Sound like a plan? Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I feel you, honey. Come here. Give me a hug. We have a winner! Now, okay, so, so there, that's a really different kind of scenario. First of all, it doesn't escalate into anger because there's, she's listening to me. You're connecting with me. You're, you're mirroring back to me. You're telling me that you hear what I'm saying to you. So that's a powerful, that's a powerful step in any intervention, right? Somebody's got an issue. They want to share it or they do share it in some way. And you say, I hear you and I feel for you. This is, this is really what you're telling me is really an issue. It, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. It feels terrible, you know, and I want to just say that I understand those of you who are listening, like, oh my goodness, you know, it would never go down in my house like that. <laughs> or I would get really frustrated, you know, if my child kept coming home and doing that and I had to go through that whole spiel that would take a really long time and I would lose patience. So we understand that it might go uh, any which way, you know, at your house, but we're just trying to give you some basic ideas of what you can do and how you can approach it in a way that will lead to connection, right? So the main ideas from what we did were connect with your child. If you are getting frustrated yourself, then what Ed and I both say is you need to mind the gap, which is to take a moment for yourself and allow for space to bring your frustration down. Because at the end of the day, you're not trying to control what's going on in your child's life. You are trying to guide them. Then what you can do, what I was trying to demonstrate is itty bitty steps, basically. What is the smallest step that you can encourage your child to take that is, there's almost zero chance of failure, right? There's almost zero chance of failure of taking your book out of your bag or taking your iPad or your computer or whatever it is out of your bag. Almost zero chance of failure of opening it, right? You can do these things. And why I'm asking, why I was asking him for something action-based is because oftentimes when we are perfectionistic and we're procrastinating because we just, again, don't want to show up imperfect, a lot of times we're like, well, just change your intention, you know, and then you'll feel like it. But thoughts, what we know from the research are not as effective. In fact, they're half as effective as taking an action when it comes to overcoming procrastination. So then the rub becomes, well, how are you going to take an action if you don't feel like it? So you encourage miniature actions. They are, again, twice as effective as trying to change your thoughts. So for example, if you don't feel like going to the gym, it's much more effective to actually, you know, drive to the parking lot of the gym go to the door of the gym, eventually walk inside the gym, those little miniature things that you can do, then trying to intend or change your thoughts around going because the thoughts themselves are tainted by the feelings. Uh, and the other thing I want to say, I want to uh, echo what you said, Rini, about, about it might sound a lot different in your home. Um, there's going to be there's going to be frustrations. You're going to have feelings. You're going to not do this perfectly. This show is about perfectionism and what you said before about making progress. Would it be progress to actually be aware that you're getting frustrated and actually do something for yourself to help you deal with that, even if it's taking a breath? So that would be progress. Would it be progress to actually respond to your kid and basically saying, I hear what you're saying instead of trying to fix it? Would that be progress? And the answer is yes, it would be tremendous progress. It doesn't mean that it won't go south after that, but just the awareness of it is the progress. You can't be perfect with these things. This is a classic example. I have to do it perfectly or I'm not a good parent. No, you're going to make you're going to make choices, you're going to figure out what works best for you, but the intention and the awareness that's progress. I think what's coming up for, for me when you're saying that, Ed, too, that's sort of exciting is the things that you're talking about that are progress really are in my control as a parent. I 
can control my own reactions. I can control how I am actively listening to my child and responding to my child. I can't necessarily control their response and their reactivity. However, I can control myself or I can work on that part. That's in my sphere of control. And that's amazing. And that's actually a really, a really powerful thing to be able to do is to say, being a parent doesn't mean that you have to fix everything. And that's, I do that all the time. And every time that I do, it, it causes a lot of frustration and a lot of difficulty. So these are, these are self skills too. Um, this is making space for yourself, you know, uh, I'm just identifying, I'm trying to be perfect. I'm trying to fix it. Um, I need to give myself a break. You know, so these are these are some of the the skills that we're talking about today uh, in perfectionism, the difference between making progress and trying to be perfect. Yeah, um, I think that there is really a bad rap for being imperfect as if that doesn't lead to good results. And I think that you will find evidence time and time and time again that those who are accepting of their imperfections actually are less risk averse. So they take more risks and therefore they actually do, quote unquote, succeed more because they're doing more. They're putting themselves out there more. They're making themselves vulnerable more. And I think what we need to do as parents and as educators and caretakers and grandparents and just friends of the family is model as much as we can this embracing who we are in the moment, you know, and this is where we're at and this is who we are. And we're going to show up as ourselves. And we know that sometimes we're not going to do well in that way. Right. I was, Ed and I were talking before the show and I said, I'm not sure I'm a hundred percent prepared in the way I want to be for this, but we're not holding back from recording this today. That's right. We're going to, you said that and we're going to do it. We're going to do it anyway. Now I will, we're going to recap uh, some of the skills and a few of the things that we talked about in just a second. But I, I want to tell a very quick story. Um, I was taking a class and it was a kind of a yoga exercise class. And I was the only male in the class. And it was like eight women with a female teacher and me. It's seven o'clock and it's in a studio in Malibu. And I walk in and they start stretching. And these people are, they're like Gumby. They're stretching in ways that I've never seen anybody do it. And I'm pretty inflexible and I'm, I don't, I'm not used to this. And so the teacher starts the class and I'm reaching so far beyond where I am. And I'm reaching and I'm reaching and I'm in a lot of pain. And the woman stops the class. She stops the music, she stops the meditation, she stops the class. And she comes back to where I am standing and she takes my body and she puts it in the position that it's supposed to be in, in terms of where I'm at, even though I'm not where the other people are. And she says, Ed, you're here, you're not here. You'll get there, but right now you're here and it's okay to be there and accept it and you'll have a better class. And my response was I started crying because I realized in that moment that I've been trying my whole life to be somewhere where I'm not, and it's painful. I was trying to be perfect, and I don't need to do that. That's amazing. Anyway, I also feel like that it's a call to action, you know? Can you find can you look at your life today and find that micro moment where you're not perfect, but you can embrace where you're at? Yeah, just to be where you are. It just to take a second and be where you are. It's it's enough. It's enough right now. Anyway, I said I said a lot of words, but but that really happened. Now, Rini, maybe we can recap just what we were talking about and just quickly give them, you know, these these few skills uh, today on on dear anxiety with with Rini, Jane, and Ed Krasnick talking about perfectionism. Yeah. So um, we were talking about uh, a hallmark of perfectionism is self criticism. So we need to teach our kids to speak to themselves like they speak to their friends, because most, most often all of us speak to our friends in a way that shows more compassion, right? And we can do that by doing role plays with our kids. We can do that by literally explicitly talking about it. We can um, do that by modeling it, right? So definitely speak to yourself like you are your own best friend. So that was one skill. 
when it comes to procrastination and the sort of I don't feel like taking action sometimes seems like lack of motivation. We talked about taking itty bitty actions where it's really, really hard to fail. Um, I think that one thing that we didn't talk about, but I would just like to throw in there is that kids from a really young age love to understand that mistakes actually fire neurons in their brain and grow their brain. And we often tell kids that your brain, it's an organ technically, but it's like a muscle. And that when you make a mistake, it grows your brain and makes your brain stronger, right? And you can use a variation of those words based on the age of the child. And then based on the age of the child, they like to know the science behind that. And there's a ton of science behind it, which we have in something on GoZen that I'd like to talk about, Ed, if that's cool. Of course. Okay. So we were thinking, how do we help kids that are perfectionists? How do we help any kids, right? Nobody likes to say, hey, I am a perfectionist. Can you just give me some skills? That's hard for kids. That's hard for adults. So what we like to do is tell stories. And we've written these amazing stories by our friend, colleague, and someone that works at Gozen named Lee Kreklow. And they are really good, really good stories that you would read as a story if you you know, didn't need to learn any skills. It's just a good story. So we have two stories on perfectionism. And they're short stories, but they're like 5,000 word short stories. And then we teach kids a lot of the skills that we're talking about within the story. So we're going to play a little clip from one of those stories. And if you guys are interested in learning more about that, you can go to gozen.com forward slash imperfect. Clayton was in his room with the door closed, trying to get through his math assignment. It wasn't going well. The first few problems were easy enough, but they got harder as he went along. Soon he was erasing, trying again erasing, trying a new way, erasing. The paper was a mess of mistakes, smudged and scribbled and even ripped in a spot. There was no way anyone could look at his work and think he was smart. Suddenly, there was a knock at his door. What? Clayton barked. He took the paper, slid it into a folder, and hid it in a drawer. It's just me, Claire said. Can I come in? Clayton dove into his bed and picked up his tablet. Yeah, come in, whatever. Claire opened the door. Why are you playing video games? Don't you still have homework to do? I'm not doing it. I haven't even looked at it. Probably won't. People will think you're a total slacker, his sister said. He didn't like the idea of looking like a slacker. But sometimes it was easier to act like he didn't care than it was to let people think he wasn't smart. What do you care anyway, he snipped. I guess I don't care. I just wanted to borrow your highlighters. Back in her room, Claire was studying history. History was exciting, but history was also endless. You could always know more. More dates, more names, more countries. There is no way to know where to stop studying. Claire had already read the assigned pages, but when she was done, there were too many details she couldn't remember. Claire's thoughts started getting away from her. What if all the other kids know more than I do? And why would the teacher ask us to read these chapters if she wasn't going to quiz us? She skipped dinner. She spent the rest of the night trying to memorize facts. She wanted to be prepared for anything so that if she was asked, she'd have a perfect answer and she wouldn't look dumb. And Clayton spent the rest of the night in his room too, playing video games. He wanted to be sure that, when his grades weren't perfect, he could say that it was because he didn't try, and not because he wasn't smart. So that was the reading from our imperfect, our Science of Perfectionism kit is how, is how, what it's called. So gozen.com forward slash imperfect. And these are, these are kits that, that parents can use with their kids. The other thing I found about, about gozen.com and about the things that you learn is although they're geared towards, they may be geared specifically towards parents and kids. They're really about, they're really about living well and learning how to practice these skills, these skills of emotional fitness, these skills of happiness, these skills of resilience. They're really for anybody. So I, I can recommend them, you know, personally 
as something that I've used and looked at in my own life. The the other thing I wanted to say, Rini, is I want to give them the the address where they can write in with any issues that they might be having that we can share with our listeners. We would love for you to go to gozen.com forward slash dear anxiety, which is the name of this podcast. So it's pretty easy to remember. If you have issues that you want to share, and we really encourage you to have kids share issues anonymously, of course, you can write them in or you can audio record them. If you audio record your child and you want to share that anonymously, that would be amazing. We would love to play it on air. So uh, up at the beginning, we played a clip of a, of a child talking about perfectionism. And uh, we want to end the show, as we always do, with a child giving some advice about that issue. Um, glad you listened. Please keep listening. Let us know what you're thinking and feeling. Connect through the address that Rini told you about at gozen.com. And uh, Rini, thanks for, uh, you were absolutely perfect today. As always, thank you. (laughs) You don't need to be perfect. No one's perfect. All you need to do is try your best. Everyone makes mistakes once in a while. If you have a mistake, it means like you are having an idea and it's not quite right. But then you can um, learn from that mistake sometimes. Everyone works at a different pace. And if you don't get something right away, you'll catch on to it. If you ever think you're going to disappoint your parents, you are actually not going to disappoint them. They will know that you're trying your best. And if you don't try your best, that's the only thing that you should really be worrying about. And they will be proud of you either way.